My name is Linda Costas, and for the last um, five years or so, I've been the Director of Talent and Engagement in the Office of Human Resources, and have had the pleasure of working with both Tom and John. Please now officially help me welcome John Affleck Graves, Executive Vice President, and Tom Burrish, our University Provost. Okay, so maybe if the two of you would just take a couple minutes to give the group a little bit of your background and what you do here, that would be a great way to get started. Well, first of all, let me say to my classmates and other alums, uh, welcome back to Notre Dame. I hope you have a great weekend. If there's anything Linda or John or I can do to make this more enjoyable for you, let us know. Let me start by talking uh, as an alum not as a provost. I haven't always been a provost. I led a perfectly respectable life for many years before, <laughs> before I became a provost. There's a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus who talked about change as being part of the essence of the universe. He had many famous lines about change. You've heard some. One of his most famous was, a person never walks into the same river twice because the river is never the same and the person is never the same. Many of us spent time at Notre Dame. We're not the same person as we was, as we were when we were a student at Notre Dame. But the person we've become had a foundation that we all shared when we were students back at Notre Dame. That's the instant bond that we all have that makes it so easy for us to talk to each other or when we meet a so-called stranger and find out they went to Notre Dame. There is that bond among us. I'm sure during this session we'll talk about things that have changed at Notre Dame. But to me the most important thing is that there's a lot of things that haven't changed that have stayed the same. Uh, Notre Dame has a three-part mission. It's to be a premier research university with an unsurpassed undergraduate education in which everything we do is informed by our Catholic faith and our, our values. How you instantiate those things changes from generation to generation. What was cutting edge research in the 50s and 60s and 90s isn't cutting edge research anymore. What courses you had to take to prepare yourself to compete in today's world aren't the same courses you took 30 years ago or 20 years ago or 10 years ago. But the values that underlie all of those things, I don't think have changed at Notre Dame. In fact, I think they get stronger and stronger with every generation, which comes in and in, in a way appropriate for that generation, uh, makes those values stronger as part of the university. And I hope that's the message that comes through today in our discussion, that while there's been enormous change, John has led much of it that I'm sure he'll talk about and you'll notice, the things that he and I and many others value are very much the same. I look forward to continuing the discussion after the meeting, especially in the beer tents, if I can meet you there <laughs> later on. But welcome back to campus. Yeah, let me, let me join Tom uh, in, in welcoming you. You know, we, we, we have a little thing on campus that um, when the weather's great like it is today, it's... Uh, Father John, who made it happen. <laughs> and when it's bad, it's either Tom or me. So, you know, you can th thank Father John for the, for the beautiful weather that we have and, and showcases the campus so beautifully. Um, you know, although I'm not a Notre Dame uh, grad, I, uh, I'm in my 30th year anniversary this year of being at Notre Dame. Uh, came in 87, and so it's been a, a great year for me. I've had the privilege of being on the faculty, which was just wonderful and now being in the administration. I view my job really, our job in my division is really fourfold. Um, we're, we're essentially stewards of the uh, financial, human, physical, and digital assets of the campus. So it's keeping this campus as beautiful as it is for all future generations. It's making sure that we're solvent, that our finances are in good shape, that we can survive not just today, but in the very, very long term, that everybody on campus, whether you're a staff member, a faculty member, a student, an alum, or a visitor, is treated well, treated with respect, um, just, just gets a sense of what a wonderful community this is to be in. Um, so though that's kind of the thing we do. Essentially, we service most of the um, underbelly of the university. 
I like to say is the junior officer, Father John being the senior, Tom being the number two, and I'm the number three. I do whatever they don't want to do. <laughs> yeah, so food services and cleaning and, you know, those, those sorts, of, sorts of things. But it is just a, a tremendous privilege um, to serve um, with, with a truly, and I, and I think I say this, and I know Tom would agree with me, that many people don't see the side of this person. But Father John is an exceptional leader. Um, he, he is very, very focused. On, on thinking about the long term and about thinking what's the most important thing for Notre Dame to do. And I think he's happy to leave a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff to us because he, he really wants to focus on what should Notre Dame be. And I think if he pushes us on anything, Tom, often it's on how, how do we keep the tradition that Notre Dame is vibrant and alive for these next generations so that this, next, that this generation of students and the next generation of students can feel the same way about their experience here that you did. And, and that's our responsibility as a leadership team, is to, is to preserve that. And I just wish that you know, some of you have children here, grandchildren here. Um, for me, the greatest pleasure at being at Notre Dame is not having the two of us here. You should have our young students here because they are just so talented and so wonderful. And we have such great confidence in what they're gonna do in the world that you know, they, they're going to do exactly the same things that you did, which is be wonderful community members, be successful people, contribute to, to society in really meaningful ways. And it's just a privilege to serve them. OK, switching uh, gears just a little bit. Uh, John, I know we're uh, in, in the um, last stages of uh, planning for the trail event. And in preparation early on, I know you went to Spain and you walked the El Camino in preparation. Yeah. So can you tell us what was especially memorable about that and how you think that experience is going to translate for all of us mm. that are going to be on the trail? Well, I think most memorable is trying to live with Lunani for four days. <laughs> there, there was, you know, my, my, I, hope, I hope it's not the version of hell. I hope it's purgatory, you know, and so I can, I can be prepared for, for when I get there. Um, no, it was, it was a tremendous experience, and um, it surprised me in many ways um, because it was, it was wonderful when you spend four days, it was only four, we did five days actually, uh, walking with colleagues, folks that you know, some folks that you don't know, and it builds just an amazing bond. It, it, you know, just amazing what the, that eight hours of, of walking and strugg everybody's struggling at some times and people having good, good phases at other times how it brings you together, and, and just that real sense of, of community. And then even within that, although there were a group of six or seven of us walking together, there were, there were always moments when you could be on your own and you could reflect. And um, we'd been given some nice, my daughter, one daughter gave me um, a couple of poems to read and uh, you know, told me to read one every morning before we started. And that was just a very nice touch. And you would find moments on, on the trail when you're just alone and you're in your thoughts. And it gives you a chance to step back from the, the rigor of everyday life where we're just rushing around. And, and, and really, I think it was very, very reflective time for us. And I know on the trail, that's one of the things we've brought back, is to um, have this concept of every day to have a theme. And, and to give you just something short to read in the morning, and then that while you're out there at some time, you'll be talking to people and having fun and laughing and eating, but there'll be some times where you just want to be quiet and reflect and think about your life and, and have a reflection for every day. So uh, really, uh, it, I was surprised how much it moved me. And it moved me so much that when I came home, you know, I said to my wife, you know, I would love one day for her and my two daughters and I to go and do five days like that because it is such a wonderful bonding experience. Lots of Band-Aids? Sorry? It's lots of Band-Aids? Yeah. Blisters? Oh, yeah, yeah, lots of Band-Aids, lots of, oh, I can tell you blister stories and, you know. <laughs> the one moment was, you know, really beautiful, seeing Lou suffer. It was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> oh. um, Tom, I can't believe it. We were talking about this in the green room also, but you're celebrating your 45th reunion. Um, now that you're back as provost and, and have been here for the last 12 years or so, what changes stand out most to you from when you were a student versus what you see now? 
Well, I know a couple of people in the front row. One thing that hasn't changed is the A students are still in the front row. I can't <laughs> see that. Uh, almost everything has changed. If, if I focus on things that are academic, uh, the faculty have changed, I think, significantly. I, I would say as a generalization, the faculty today are the strongest faculty Notre Dame's ever had, and I hope 20 years from now, the provost says the faculty we have today are the strongest faculty Notre Dame's ever had. That's a generalization, of course, but it's due to the fact that they're brilliant, that they're committed to the university and its values. And I think something that stands out at Notre Dame, uh, I know some other universities very well. I've worked at a couple other wonderful places. Faculty here are still committed to students including undergraduate students. At many research universities, that's not the case. The rewards, the push is for research, is for scholarship, is for your books and experiments and grants. And certainly we have that pressure here. But the faculty are really committed to students. They're terrific teachers. Uh, the students, undergraduate students, are involved in research more and more. We ran a, uh, a study and looked at the average course ratings of every professor. Every class, every semester is rated by the students. We looked at our endowed chair professors. Those are the best, if you will, the most senior, the well, best known, and they're usually judged for research, and that's how you get an endowed chair. Their teaching evaluations were higher than any other group of faculty at the university. I'll bet that's not true at any other university. That, the very best research faculty are the very best teachers of undergraduate students at the university. It's quite extraordinary. I think the students have changed enormously. I'll talk a little about SATs and things like that, but what's just as impressive is that they're involved in all these different activities. Some years, a majority of our students were captains of athletic teams in high school. We have students who have started companies. We have students who published. We have students who speak multiple languages. Uh, we had one student who was in 13 foster homes. Oh, God. She was valedictorian of her class. We have students who, we have one student whose address was a homeless shelter. That's where she lived with her mother. Uh, she gra graduated in the top 5% of her class. Somehow these students make it to Notre Dame. You hear a lot about grade point averages and SAT scores going up, and they have. I'll, I'll give you a very interesting statistic. This year, approximately 7,500 students apply to Notre Dame who are either in the top 1% of national test takers in this country, top 1% of their high school class, or both. We rejected the majority of those students. We rejected more than 2,000 valedictorians this year because there's just not space for them. That's what you hear and you think, well, all they're looking at is SAT scores or I could never get in or the people I know could never get in, which is not true and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment, except if you're in the class I was in, 72 or earlier, because we are strapped with the realization that if women had been admitted, half of us would never have been admitted no matter <laughs> what the SAT score was. <laughs> When I talk to my classmates, 80% of us think we're in that 50% that wouldn't have been admitted if, if uh, we came today with women. But these students are just phenomenal individuals that have done so much. And they are tomorrow's university. They're the alums and the parents of the future. And the third big change is from, from all of you. I don't know how it happens, but every year it seems that alums and parents and grandparents and friends are more supportive of the university than they were the year before. And I mean that financially, but I mean it in so many other ways too, in helping us recruit students and helping us hire students and getting the reputation out about the university. People comment all over the country, no matter where they went to school, about the bond that Notre Dame people have. It doesn't mean we don't disagree with each other once in a while, that you're not happy with something that happened at the university, but there's some kind of a bond that exists here that you just don't see at many other universities. And somehow, that seems to get stronger and stronger and stronger, for which John and I and Father John and Linda and others are, are so grateful to all of you. 
So there's a little bit of construction going on, John. Um, and certainly we know that the alumni would love to know about what's going on right now on campus, what's projected, any kinds of updates that you can give. Yeah, I think it's been a really exciting time for us on campus. You know, um, you know the, um, a lot of people say, why, why is there so much construction on campus? Uh, there's so much co construction on campus because there, there's so much demand. Um, our students are demanding more of us. Um, our, our young students we have now don't want to sit just in a classroom with 40 or 50 other students and have a professor talk to them. They want to do research with that professor. So we have many more research professors, as you said. Those research professors don't only do their own, the, the, the myth that they go into their office and they close their door and, and they shut away is not that. They work with our undergraduate students. They have undergraduate students in labs. They have undergraduate students in research projects. They have under, undergraduate students in projects in psychology and, and sociology and economics. And those are tremendous opportunities for our students. So, you know, we're doing um, on the east side of the stadium, Corbett Family Hall, you know, the second, third, second floor is anthropology, third, fourth, and fifth floor are psychology. Lots of that space is for labs. And, and those labs are tremendous because we're doing tremendous work, and Tom should talk to this more because he's a, a psychologist, psychology faculty member. But I mean, you know, we're doing work on, on you know, what brings families together, what makes families work. It's a, it's a huge contribution we make, I think, to, to, to the world in understanding those problems and having young students work on those problems with our faculty are tremendous. So, yeah, Crossroads is, as we've called it, the three buildings around the stadium are are coming to completion. They add very much needed um, academic space for us. For the first time in our history, sacred music and music will be together in a single facility and we'll have practice facility for our students that, that, that's top rate. So really excited about that. Then we have, of course, the most important building on campus, the one that bears my boss's name, Jenkins <laughs> Hall. So got to make sure that that building gets finished on time and it looks really nice. So we're out polishing the, you know, the name tag on the, on the building. Uh, that's going to you know, house um, all of our um, international institutes. So just uh, you know, so, so much of the world now is global and international. So lots of construction going on. And um, tomorrow, just a little plug, um, one of our university architects, Mike Daly, is going to do a session on, at 1.30 on the future of our campus. And um, I'm not sure how many of you know, but under Father Tim Scully, we started this concept of um, planning forward the campus. So we do a five to ten year plan, buildings that are on the, kind of in the, in the mix now. And then we do 25 years, what will the campus look like? And then what's the next hundred years going to look like? So we don't know what the buildings are going to be, but we start to lay out the campus so that when we put a building in, um, we know that in the future there will be a quad there. So we don't put a building down in the middle of somewhere and then later regret it because we want a quad to be. So any of you walk to the east side of campus and, and you look at where you know, the new residence halls are, Flaherty and Dunn, and then McCourtney at, at top, you can see we built another beautiful um, um, quad there that's, that's going to get closed out. You know, it could be five years, it could be 10 years before that quad gets closed out. But at some time, that quad will be finished, and it'll be a beautiful quad, like South Quad or like the Bartolo Quad. And so, but you have to plan ahead even when you don't know what the buildings will be so that when Tom or Father John comes to me and says, oh, we need a facility to do this, we can say, well, here's an inventory of sites. You can't go and choose any site on campus. This is the way we see the campus may look 50 or 100 years from now, even though we don't know what those buildings will be. So lots of exciting things <laughs> happening. And if, if, you, if you're interested in the campus and where the campus is going in the future, uh, come and hear Mike Daly uh, speak. The uh, uh, architecture office has done a tremendous job with this plan. That's great. So, Tom, going back to Crossroads for a minute, the three buildings, can you give us a window into the magic that's going to be going on in there? Sure, but let me say first, uh, John Affleck Graves and his team deserve an enormous amount of credit for all of this construction that goes on, and yet it looks like a single integrated campus. People can't believe sometimes that this building is new. It looks like it's been here forever and belongs here. I remember when I first came back to Notre Dame, I said to John, you run a city. Now, literally, it's true. As you know, Notre Dame, Indiana, is its own city, its own zip code, and so forth. But this city has 
more churches than most cities have. <laughs> I think there are 60 some chapels. It has a big public housing project with the people who live in them, the students who refuse to mow the grass or shovel the <laughs> sidewalk. In fact, they demand we cook all their meals for them. You have guests who come in the fall and think that they can cook hamburgers and drink beers in the parking lot, and they, they're all over the place. Uh, you have faculty and administrators who drive in, work here, pay no taxes, but criticize John all the time about why isn't there something here or something there. You might say he's got, and his team have the hardest job, or one of the hardest jobs at the university, and they do. And the beauty of this place is not an accident. Uh, I'm just not my guys for the faculty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He controls the budget. I'm going to ask him for something in a moment for the budget. But it, it really is, it is phenomenal. Thank you. The, the space that has gone up will allow us to do things we just can't do. And one of the normal questions that you would have, I would think, there aren't many more students. Why do we need all this new space? This isn't an adequate answer, but just so you put this in the context, if you look at the major private research universities in America, the top 30 of them, let's say, or 40, we're in the bottom group in terms of number of square feet per faculty member, per grant dollar, per student, however you look at it. Believe it or not, Notre Dame is not a leader. It's a catching up to where the others are. Now, that's not a adequate explanation. Just because others are doing it doesn't mean that we should do it. But let me tell you about some of the, of the magic that goes on in the crossroads and some of the other buildings. And I want to start with the other buildings, Jenkins Hall uh, and Nanavik Hall. It's really one building, but two halves. Our new Keough School of Global Affairs is going to be there. It's the first new school in 100 years. It's a school that's going to help us be a much more global institution than we've ever been before. We'll have undergraduate programs and a master's degree and a PhD in these areas. We have all these international institutes that were all by themselves, Kroc, Keo, Nanavik, et cetera. Now they're together, so the whole will be greater than the sum of the parts. It will connect with our global gateways that are all over the world and will be expanding to allow our students to study abroad. Sixty-some percent of Notre Dame undergraduate students, when they graduate, have credit from a foreign university on their transcript. That's what we mean by study abroad. This isn't a vacation or we traveled through. It's you studied, you earned credit. That's going to facilitate that in a way never done before. Music and sacred music. Music is now in Crowley Hall. When I was a student, Crowley was a psychology building. We ran rats in Crowley Hall. That's what it was designed for. There's no dampening of sound. So people are practicing, rehearsing, playing the piano, having a lesson. You hear it in the next room. There's no elevator. How do you get a piano to the second floor? If you're handicapped, you can't get to the second floor of Crowley. It, it's just not an adequate building. We never had sacred music before. This is within the last several years, we created a sacred music program. It is led by two individuals, among the leaders are two individuals, one had an endowed chair at Princeton, one endowed chair at Yale, that came to Notre Dame to create this program. They've never had space for the first time. They'll have space in this building. Psychology is in seven different buildings on campus today. It'll go down to three. The two that will remain, in addition to the one in the crossroads, that do clinical work. One is over by a psychiatric facility that does some clinical work, and one is uh, downtown more on 23 that works with families and children. But all of the other research, as John said, the, the experiments that just we couldn't do before in cognition, for example, or with some of the imaging techniques that come out on brain work, that's now possible in that building. So we'll do things we couldn't do with students that never had an opportunity to be in a lab when John and I and Father John began working together, we had about 60 some million dollars a year in research. That has more than doubled. You have to have space to do that research in. And for us, it's not just going to be faculty and graduate students, undergraduates are going to participate. And these labs allow them to do that. So it, it really will help us transform a lot of the things that are going to go on in the future at Notre Dame. Okay, so one more question about construction, John. I know some of the <laughs> alums have noticed uh, that there's some construction going on over towards Innovation Park. Can you just tell us a little bit about what's going on there? 
Sure. So I think you know, um, maybe um, eight or nine years ago, we built an innovation park, um, innovation park in Notre Dame, um, on the south side, side of campus. Uh, and again, that's partly coming out of the great research that we're doing. And the faculty members today are different from the faculty members when I came in. When I came in as a faculty member, you did your research, and you know it was it was done for the academic community, and it was the creation of knowledge, but it was for other people, and uh, it, people weren't as focused on does it have a real world application. That has changed today. Uh, faculty members, whether they're in psychology, they want they want to see that their research has an impact on people's lives. Or if they're in science or engineering, they, they, want, they want to see that product come to market because they're trying to cure a disease or, they, or they're trying to, trying to make um, planes safer. And so um, that whole concept of the professor no longer being in the ivory tower only, uh, the professor now wants to see their research impact the world. And part of our mission is to be a source for good in the world and our research uh, serves that mission. But it only serves that mission if we get it out and we convert it into things that impact people on a, on a daily basis. And so Innovation Park was built with that concept. How do, we, how do we take some of the research that's been here and create that first step where we can transform the research into a product that can actually serve humanity today? And I'm um, very pleased that under Tom's leadership, We've been absolutely phenomenal that, that that space is full. And so we're very pleased that we're building this new additional space. And um, it, we're going to have a new center called the Idea Center. But the person who has led this, the person whose dream that is, the person who's provided the, the momentum and the impetus and the resources to do it is sitting on the stage with me. And so he should tell you about what it's going to be in the Idea Center. Well, I'd be happy to. John uh, is being very modest. John was involved in the community in a way that no one else at Notre Dame is. A lot of people are involved in the community. But to, just to give you a, an example of this, the governor of, of the state, actually the, the former governor, put aside millions of dollars and said, we're going to have a competition among regions in the state for that money in order to develop financially the communities around them. This would be for, for development in your community and there will be a competition. The prize was, I think, $42 million if you got one of these. There were going to be two. I think there ended up to be three. South Bend area, three counties, won one of these. $42 million for economic development in this region. The chair that put it all together was John. So when we talk about community development, things going on here, that's probably the biggest and most exciting. We do hope that Innovation Park, which is a research park, will contribute to that in some significant way. John is right. Universities have always been hotbeds of innovation. Faculty create things. We call it intellectual property. But faculty didn't take it to the marketplace. Innovation by itself has no impact. It has to be used. You have to pair innovation with entrepreneurship. That's the mechanism by which this new thing gets to a customer or a company or someone that will use it in a creative way that betters humankind. That's what we're trying to do in Innovation Park. We're not good at that. I'm not good at that. The faculty aren't good at that. A few of them are, but we're mostly academics. So we put together a committee, largely of people, in fact, all except myself, of people who had no connection to Notre Dame academically. They were graduates in some cases. Sometimes they were not. And we asked them, how do we be best in class? That is, we're a university with no medical school. We're in a fairly small city. We're in the Midwest. How can we create a research park to take our faculty's innovation to the marketplace in a way that's best of class? They gave us 24 recommendations, and that's what we're up to right now in that new building with the first building as well. We've hired a dynamic new leader, 
Brian Ritchie, who with the mayor of South Bend has a session, I think later today, at 2.30 this afternoon, to talk about this. So if you're interested in it, you might look for that session in which Brian and Mayor Pete Buttigieg are going to talk about innovation and community development here. But it's a really exciting innovation, innovation, it's exciting development for us because the faculty just love the fact that we can take what they've developed and bring it to the marketplace in whatever way is most appropriate. It could be a startup company, it could be a license, it could be a variety of different things. And that's what that second building and reorienting the first building is going to be like. It's really an important thing for us. I'm going to ask both of you one more question each, and then we're going to move quickly to um, questions from the audience. So if you have questions, you can start to prepare those. And when we call you up, please come to one of the microphones uh, in order to ask your questions so everyone can hear. Couple, just a couple quick uh, questions more for you. Tom, um, moving from innovation to internationalization, um, can you tell us what's going on with the international footprint, how we're increasing that, and what are the most exciting new developments? No university can be a great university in the 21st century if it's not a global university. If you're regional, even if that region is the United States of America, and that's all you have, you're not going to be prepared to compete or understand the world we're in today. So Notre Dame has to be more of a global university. How do you do that? There are three major ways, or a lot of ways. You bring international students and faculty to the university so they can educate you about other countries and what things are like there. You send your faculty and students out into the world. And you have a curriculum which is international, comparative monetary systems, religions of the non-Western world, and the list goes on and on. Notre Dame's got to be strong in all of those areas. We're strong in some, we're not strong in all of them. The School of Global Affairs is going to help us enormously. The other thing we've done is created what's called Notre Dame International. It's an office which tries to coordinate all the international things on campus. We have another dynamic new leader, Michael Pippinger, who came to us from Columbia a year ago, just finishing his first year. He runs that office. He and his predecessor have taken our study abroad programs and converted them into what we call global gateways. The concept there is students will study abroad there, but faculty will go there, and they'll do research with faculty in that part of the world. We'll have conferences there. We'll have meetings there. We'll take Notre Dame to the world and the world to Notre Dame through these global gateways. We have a lot of them right now, several of them in Europe. We have one in China. We have some new offices starting that we hope will become global gateways in South America. There's only so much capacity, so we can't have them everywhere, but they will help us internationalize the campus as well as uh, the new school in a way we just haven't had before, but it will be superb for our students coming through. Every student, no matter what the major, can touch some of these global things before they graduate. Thank you. And John, our students love studying abroad. We know that. We have a very high percentage of them that go and study abroad, but their home is always going to be here on campus and in the residence halls. Um, can you describe some of the, I'm sorry, back to con construction again, but <laughs> can you describe some of the renovations and investments the university has done in our dorms and how this is going impact, to impact residential life? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's another area where um, Notre Dame is different from every other university, and we want to be different. And that's in our commitment to residence life. In many ways, it, it is the defining experience of our students at campus, is their residence life. Whether it's their friends that they make for life, whether it's exploring their spirituality and dorm masses on a Sunday night, uh, whether it's their relationship with their rector. For us, the, the community of a residence hall is extremely important. And that's why we've gone down to this model now where we think um, we don't want residence halls to have more than 250, 260 students. It gets too many, it gets too impersonal. You don't want to be below 200, because then if you have four classes, there's not enough to form a cohort for the class. And so we found out that that mix for us between 200 and 250 students is the ideal size for a residence hall. It's big enough that there's, uh, there's enough of your class there, and it's small enough that you can know everybody and, and be personal. 
The other area that we've differed from other universities, the trend in residence halls across the country is to, to move to what I would equivalently call um, studio living. And so um, every student gets their own room. Um, there may be three or four single rooms of a central lounge and, and with a bathroom. That is not the model we're going with. Um, so we still have the majority of our rooms are shared rooms. Um, we make our rooms purposely a little smaller than others, all right? Come on, they're luxurious, they're beautiful. <laughs> Um, no, have we you do. Been in Dillon lately? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we have. In the new dorms, we, we are significantly below the national average on square feet per student in their room. And what we're investing in is in social spaces in the dorms. Because we don't want our students to come out of class or doing their recreation and go back and sit in their room and study on their own. What we want them to do is to go down to a study room where there are three or four other students. We want them to work with their other students. We want them to have social space so that they don't go up to their room to watch the football game or the basketball game. They go down to the social space and, and they mix with the other kids in, in the dorm. So, so our dorms overall on a square foot basis are the same, but, but we really want that sense of community. And so, so we make the, the actual living areas just a little smaller, a little tighter, community bathrooms, and then lots of great community space. And I, I think it's worked very well. Uh, Dunn and Flaherty have been very successful mm -hmm. halls for us under that model. Oh, Aaron, beautiful. Aaron Harding has done a tremendous job leading that effort. That's great. So very, very deliberate about what we're trying to do in student life and build community. And I think we've run out of time. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.